Well, welcome everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amy Moss. I have the pleasure of moderating today's panel on uh, who can we sue? And uh, as a recovering lawyer myself, I think the answer to that is probably everybody and anybody that we want to. Uh, but we have some esteemed panelists with us today to talk about some of the legal uh, and liability and regulatory issues that sort of lay the, the groundwork for the future of mobility and uh, automated connected vehicle technology. So <clears throat> you can't see my screen, but I can tell you I am doing personally a fireside chat. My fire is on, the sun is out, and uh, it's a very uh, comfortable and, and fun way to do a, a panel like this. I've never done it before, so please bear with us. We'll hopefully have uh, smooth sailing and, and not have any issues. Um, but I, what, what we thought we would do here this morning, we have four panelists with us with varied background and expertise. And we thought we would kick it off by uh, essentially, I will introduce each panelist and they will, uh, the panelists will, will uh, give you a little bit about their background, a little bit about their perspective and how they come to these issues and um, do some introductory remarks. Then we'll move on to, you know, through our, all of our four panelists. And then we will open it, we, we have some uh, prepared questions that our panelists can weigh in on. And then certainly, I think there is an opportunity for uh, audience members to uh, send a chat or somehow uh, interact with Calvin and, and we can potentially entertain a few questions from the audience depending on timing and, and if technology works. So I will, uh, with that, just jump into introducing our panelists and letting them make some introductory remarks. I first want to introduce to you David Yang. David is the executive director of the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety, and he oversees the day-to-day -day operations of this nonprofit research and education organization. Before joining the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety, he was with the Federal Highway Administration, United States Department of Transportation. Dr. Yang has co-authored approximately 50 peer-reviewed journals, journal articles, conference papers, and government reports on subjects related to traffic safety, operations, planning, and intelligent transportation systems. An ITE journal article that he co-authored won the Institute of Transportation Engineers 2015 Traffic Engineering Council Best Paper Award. He is an associate editor for the Journal of Intelligent Transportation Systems, Technology Planning and Operations, and a member of the editorial board for the International Journal of Transportation Science and Technology. Dr. Yang serves uh, as an advisory board member on a number of university transportation centers funded by the US Department of Transportation. He is a fellow Big Ten graduate. He attended the Purdue University and received his Bachelor of Science, Master of Science, and Doctor of Philosophy degrees in the field of civil engineering. In April 2018, he was honored with the Civil Engineering Alumni Achievement Award from Purdue University. And I will turn it over to David Yang to make some opening remarks. Thank you, Amy. Uh, and uh, good morning, uh, everyone uh, online. Uh, just, uh, you know, uh, just a great honor to be able to participate in this, uh, this uh, event. I was uh, invited, uh, I believe, about two or three years ago to a very similar uh, symposium at the uh, University of uh, Michigan. So it's always great to, um, to uh, participate and take part in uh, this event. So uh, as uh, Amy has uh, introduced uh, my background, as you know that I'm not a lawyer, so I won't be able to answer the question on who do we sue. But I think I will be able to share with you some of my perspective about, uh, you know, what are some of the role that each, uh, each player within the, this, uh, you know, within the area of uh, advanced uh, technology that we, we have to play. And what I want to do is really in my opening remark, uh, kind of touch upon three points. And I hope that, and, and hopefully at the end, and basically my, my fellow panelists will be able to, uh, to also uh, talk about different aspects about uh, issues related to uh, liability and so forth. So my, uh, for, for my first point, I really want to stress that you know it is I it is my belief as well as uh, many people who are involved with this whole area related to vehicle automation and and advanced driver assistance system ADAS is that we believe that these uh, technology they can uh, really the ultimate goal is to use these uh, technology to improve safety to reduce crashes <laughs> and uh, you know whether 
you have a level one ADAS system or you are driving a, uh, a, a vehicle that's, uh, that's featuring level two system or you are doing research that's looking to level uh, four, four or five. I think really, you know, that is really our goal is that we don't want to see uh, on the annual basis that uh, people lost their life uh, by going uh, to work, by coming home, uh, really from point A to point B. However, what we have found uh, in many of our research that was con um, um, conducted uh, at Tupay Foundation for Traffic Safety in the past uh, several years is that users' uh, understanding and behavior can, and, and, you know, it, they will impact the end result on how these uh, technology will, uh, will help you. Or in some cases, um, if there's uh, misuse or abuse of these uh, system, that could lead into um, you know, um, very, very um, uh, unpleasant result. During the past few years, we have seen very uh, several high profile crashes that's uh, related to some vehicle that feature these uh, advanced system. And many of these uh, uh, investigation has pointed to that the user um, basically are, you know, play a, a, a very uh, big role in, uh, that's leading to these crashes. But also, um, we also, I also, um, you know, believe that um, basically um, the developer and the provider um, basically is really all of us who are in this call, who are participating in doing research and developing the product. We play a big, uh, a very big role that we can uh, help to minimize misuse or uh, abuse of these um, uh, technology so that the ultimate goal and the intended, con uh, intended outcome can be achieved. We have to carry out uh, several research uh, um, since uh, 2017 and 2018. Uh, in one of our uh, research work that, that was carried out on, um, on our behalf by University of Iowa that was published on our website in September 2018, we have found that basically people who own ADAS system for a year or two, there's still a misunderstanding about what type of system they have, about you know, how certain functionality can work. We have a, a respondent who provided uh, basically feedback that they thought they have a, uh, a automatic emergency brake in their vehicle, turned out to be adaptive cruise control. Last year, at the end of last year in 2019, we have um, um, Virginia Tech Transportation Institute carry out a separate research looking at the uh, national driving uh, study data from two sources. And what that study has found is that when, when drivers are engaging in, um, basically when they are using uh, one or two type, one or more type of uh, ADAS system, they have a higher likelihood of uh, engaging in secondary non-driving uh, related tasks, being distracted. Um, other activity that while, while they are operating a vehicle. And uh, uh, we have yet to publish a few uh, research re uh, results, but one of the results that, that will be published very soon in the future, um, basically it was a work that was carried out for, for us on behalf of a company called Westat, has found that training and education does make a difference on p how people will react on how they will interact with these uh, system. So for me, I really believe is that really, if we wanna uh, achieve the ultimate goal of uh, improving safety for our ADAS and uh, automated vehicles uh, system, uh, not only, you know, basically the driver, we, you know, really the, the community, which is the, uh, the developer, the provider, the manufacturer, we need to help the driver to make uh, better uh, decision and hopefully um, um, better behavior in terms of using these uh, uh, technology appropriately. So I'm going to conclude my opening remark here and then uh, Amy, I'll hand the uh, time back to you. Great, thank you. Our next panelist is a practicing lawyer, uh, Tom Brannigan is a trial lawyer and senior partner in the Bowman and Brook LLP law firm. He is currently the managing partner of the firm's Detroit office, where he represents automotive OEMs and suppliers in high-stakes product liability trials, 
class actions, multi-district litigation, and regulatory matters throughout the United States. Tom has been included in most of the major legal rating services, including the Best Lawyers in America, Chambers, the Legal 500, Leading Lawyers, Who's Who in American Law, and Martindale Hubble, where he is AV rated as, quote, preeminent in his field. Additionally, Tom was named a 2012 Michigan Leader in the Law by Michigan Lawyers Weekly. Besides his active automotive-related trial practice, he is currently counseling or defending numerous automotive and technology clients in matters involving self-driving technology, automotive cybersecurity, connected vehicle issues, and active and passive safety. As a lifelong resident of the Motor City and as someone who has worked in or for the auto industry since 1980, Tom has a unique understanding of the challenging issues facing automotive OEMs and suppliers today. His firm, Bowman & Brook, is one of the world's leading law firms in the realm of automotive-related litigation. The firm represents most major OEMs and many automotive suppliers and technology companies in existence today. So, Tom, have some opening remarks. Thank you, Amy. Very kind words. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be able to participate in this program. I'm glad we were able to continue it um, under these uh, unique circumstances. Well, uh, because I am a practicing trial lawyer, I, I uh, have been asked to comment on a question that I get asked very frequently these days when I'm talking about um, autonomous vehicles, uh, advanced driver assist systems. And that question is, is there any litigation today? And the answer is pretty simple. Because this is America where litigation is everywhere 24 seven, there is active litigation across the country in state and federal courts involving advanced driver assistance systems, ADAS. And in fact, I was just retained three days ago by an OEM uh, to defend a new case involving ADAS issues. So not even COVID-19 can stop it or slow it down. Um, on, on the question of what types of claims are we seeing in current litigation today? Well, we're seeing a variety of product liability design defect claims. We are defending claims about the absence of certain ADAS technology. For example, the absence of forward collision warning systems, advanced emergency braking systems. And these include cases where plaintiffs claim that the absence of ADAS, like the systems I just identified, rather than the driver's negligence was the cause of a crash. We're also seeing uh, drivers and owners of struck vehicles, vehicles that have been um, impacted by another vehicle, for example, a vehicle that was rear-ended by another vehicle, claim that because the striking vehicle lacked technology like forward collision warning or advanced emergency braking, the striking vehicle is defective, unreasonably dangerous, and the cause of the crash. So in other words, not the driver of the striking vehicle, but the OEM that made the vehicle without that technology is at fault for that crash. In cases where a vehicle is equipped with ADAS technology, like a vehicle that has autopilot or propilot assist, screws, the claims range from traditional product liability design defect, breach of warranty, failure to warrant claims, to cases with allegations of fraud and misrepresentation against the OEM and the seller, in cases with those allegations, the plaintiffs are alleging that the ADAS technology did not work as advertised. And that is the real reason for the crash in their view. Uh, some of my OEM clients are also seeing some interesting litigation pursued by certain members of the insurance industry. The insurance companies, not their insureds. These are cases against OEMs with ADAS technology capable of collecting storing or transmitting large quantities of vehicle and vehicle user data. And in those cases, the insurer is suing the OEM to obtain access to large quantities of that data from the ADAS equipped vehicle. Now this is rather interesting because the plaintiff insurance company in this litigation is suing in part to learn about a particular crash that involved an insured vehicle, but also because and I'm quoting now from a case that I'm involved in. Data access is essential to developing proper pricing and underwriting 
of vehicles. So those aren't my words. Those are the words of one large insurance company that is involved in active litigation and one of, uh, with one of my OEM clients today. So this last strain of ADAS-related litigation raises a number of new issues for my OEM clients involving data privacy and data preservation issues, which I think we'll talk about more as the, the discussion of this panel continues. Uh, you can't talk about the cases without talking about the defenses. So let me turn to that for a minute. Our primary defense against litigation involving ADAS has been, and I think it will continue to be, that vehicles on the road today with or without ADAS are reasonably safe and not defective. Now, to some of you, that, that may sound trite, but it's the reality. Where ADAS technology has been added to or is available for a vehicle, the reason for its availability is not to fix a defect. Instead, it's to improve a vehicle that is already safe. And these are technological advancements to improve technology that is in the main already very good, very safe for motorists. So we, we I believe, will continue to see that as a principal feature of our defense to, this to claims about this technology. Other defenses include the fault of the user. It's important to remember that the ADAS technology that we have on the road today is SAE level one and level two, and soon, probably within the next model year or two model years, we'll, we'll begin to see SAE level three technology on the road. However, even with these levels of ADAS, the human driver is still 100% responsible for executing the task of driving and complying with applicable traffic rules. That's certainly the case with SAE level one and level two technology, like uh, forward collision warning, lane departure warning, even autopilot. Yet my cases are filled with examples of plaintiffs doing really dumb, that's the legal uh, word for unreasonable, things like texting, Googling, failing to understand the limits of this technology that they paid a lot of money for, or their own responsibilities while using it. So comparative fault, contributory negligence, misuse of the product, assumption of the risk, those are all traditional defenses that we have had at our disposal in traditional product liability, automotive design defect, and even manufacturing defect cases over the years and they will continue to be part of our defense uh, barrage for this technology going forward. In cases where a plaintiff has alleged that the absence of, of ADAS was the cause of a crash and that the absence means that their vehicle is defective, some courts are now agreeing with our defense that those claims are preempted because of the way the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is going about regulating that technology. But I'll have more to say on that point in a few minutes. Amy, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Great, thank you. Um, I actually learned something just from your opening remarks already. I was not even aware of the uh, insurance litigation, although those issues are certainly near and dear to my heart um, as I have become intimately familiar with the insurance side of things from my current role. So thank you. Uh, moving on to Ryan Harrington, who's our next panelist, uh, another uh, panelist with engineering background. He's a principal within the vehicle engineering practice at Exponent and is based out of Natick, Massachusetts. Having worked directly on the development of automotive, uh, automotive technologies and federal regulations, Mr. Harrington specializes in the analysis of complex technical and policy issues while fostering collaboration between industry executives senior government officials and engineers related to the deployment of emerging automotive technologies, including automated vehicles, uh, advanced driver assistance systems, and fuel savings technologies. Prior to joining Exponent, Mr. Harrington was a division chief at the U.S. Department of Transportation's Volpe Center, where he led a cross-functional team focused on the, develop, uh, on the deployment of advanced transportation technologies. Mr. Harrington also worked as technical support manager at Cummins, and a product development engineer at Delphi Automotive Systems. Mr. Harrington holds a master's degree in automotive engineering 
from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. So another Big Ten guy. Uh, in his spare time, he competes in the Sports Car Club of America autocross racing. Uh, and with that, Ryan, you want to share some opening remarks? Absolutely. Thank you, Amy. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak at the symposium today. Um, so I'll kind of follow on with some of the um, themes that Tom and David have, have identified. Um, you know, so as you heard Tom talk about um, that, you know, when it comes to, you know, especially ADAS technologies, there's, you know, failure to equip claims. So the vehicle wasn't, or the technology wasn't deployed, deployed quickly enough. Uh, there's also claims that, that the systems weren't mature enough and didn't, um, uh, operate as expected by the consumers, that there was too many nuisance alerts uh, or did not warn in a particular situation. So the OEMs are kind of having to deal with both sides of the fence. Um, and and you know, a lot of this points to the points that David had made about kind of drivers understanding the realistic expectations of these systems. Um, and so in order to provide some context, um, I think it's worth looking at kind of the development and deployment of, of ADAS technologies over time. Um, what industry has been doing and what the government has been doing and then, um, how academia has been a part of that as well. Um, so I think, you know, an important point to note that, um, you know, the USDOT, uh, NHTSA, the ITS Joint Program Office have been working with uh, industry and academia for many decades, now, almost two decades, uh, doing field operational tests to bring some of these technologies to market. And, and the role of these um, sister, um, field operational tests was to help bring the technology to a higher level of maturity, look at the driver vehicle interface and how to help um, inform and warn drivers uh, with these systems. Um, the University of uh, Transportation, uh, University, uh, University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute um, was a part of you know, many of these. I was a part of the integrated vehicle-based safety system while I was at the DOT, worked with uh, Jim Sayer and Debbie Bazina. Um, you know, IVBSS looked at forward collision warning, lane departure warnings, and, and curve speed warnings, and how do you integrate those into a vehicle. And so there's a lot of lessons learned over time. The technology has been maturing, and I think you have to look at that when you look at the context of how quickly has a technology come online, what are the, what are the technical challenges uh, in deploying that technology. Um, and, and to that point, um, you know, NHTSA has been looking at um, how to best inform drivers, educate drivers about ADAS technologies. And so part of the um, uh, NCAP, New Car Assessment Program, you know, it's known as Stars for Cars, you know, on the Monroney label or the sticker of the vehicle, you can, uh, manufacturers can show that um, this vehicle has forward collision warning, lane departure warning, uh, AEB or uh, rear, rear vis systems. So, you know, NHTSA has been um, letting manufacturers show what techn technologies are on a vehicle. But in order to do that, you have to pass some confirmation tests. So it's not mandated, but if you're going to um, uh, show that a vehicle has a technology, it's got to meet some minimum threshold. And I think it's interesting if you look at, you know, how many years it's taken NHTSA to develop the procedures. They revise them over time. Um, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, false positive testing. Um, there's some minimum thresholds that are uh, probabilistic in nature. So um, as, as anybody who's been a part of the testing, you know, it's, you got to coordinate the vehicles when you do the testing, you know, their, their relative velocities, where they're positioned relative to each other. Um, and so to choreograph all that, you have to kind of meet some thresholds uh, and requirements, and that's considered a valid test. Uh, and then you have a pass-fail criteria. And, and NHTSA has, in many of these cases, um, uh, said that you have to, you can pass, you need to pass five out of seven times in order to get, you know, kind of a passing grade and able to put this on your vehicle which I think is interesting, right? It's not a typical pass-fail criteria. You can, you know, still fail two of the valid tests and still be considered to have, you know, a technology that meets a particular threshold. And I think that really speaks to um, the, the challenges with these technologies that, you know, they are sensitive to operating environments, uh, lighting conditions, uh, lane markings and things like that. And so um, as you start thinking about how that's rolled out into the real world, you know, where there's a lot of uh, variability uh, that, that kind of speaks to the, the sensitivity of these systems that even in a controlled environment, um, the systems are very sensitive to how they're being operated. Um, and, you know, and that, that goes into the complexity of the systems, the, the driver interface that, that David had talked about. And, you know, these are driver assisted systems that have safety benefits, um, but there's a balance between the alert timing so that you don't provide too many nuisance alerts, but you issue, you know, valid alerts uh, in the appropriate time frame. Um, and a lot of the work on the safety benefit side has been based on these field operational tests and they estimate benefits. You know, some of those benefits are starting to become um, are being developed on kind of more real world data, 
uh, becoming a little bit more concrete. And so it's helped, you know, kind of show what are the true safety benefits, you know, are there unintended consequences of all of this? Uh, and as, as, as we start moving from ADAS to automated vehicles, you know, the question of how safe is safe enough, how do you define safety? Is it the societal level? Is it the individual level? Um, and then how do you start thinking about, uh, you know, baselines um, with over the air updates, Vehicles uh, and systems, uh, technologies, or technology, the performance and capabilities improving over time. So you've got this baseline that's moving. Um, you know, how do you measure and consider crashes that were avoided? So you can uh, put those into the safety equation as well. So there's a lot that goes into that. Um, and then as, as far as how quickly a technology can come online, um, you know, there are many things that uh, impact the development and deployment of a technology. You know, some of these allegations are it was on a vehicle in one model year. And by the next model year, 100% of, of a manufacturer's fleet should have a particular technology. And we really got to look at, um, you know, what are the different considerations that define how quickly technology can come online? Um, and there's been a lot of studies about how, um, you know, from the first implementation of a technology to when it's kind of saturated the market, what does that time frame look like? And, and uh, typically that's numerous decades, and it has to deal with uh, capital investment, IP issues, um, the maturity, the manufacturing process. Uh, design, product, and durability, uh, validation, testing, vehicle refresh, and redesign cycles, supplier capacity, and then, you know, some of the stuff that David had talked about is consumer acceptance and affordability. So, you know, all of that plays into um, how quickly these technologies can come online, how quickly they mature, and, you know, a lot of that speaks to uh, some of the cases that Tom had talked about where, you know, the allegations are that, it, you know, there was a failure to equip, it should have had this technology, but you got to go back and look at what does it take to bring a technology to market in a very robust and meaningful way. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back over to you, to Amy. Great, thank you so much, Ryan. <clears throat> um, our fourth panelist is uh, somebody who has become a good friend of mine over the last few years, Emily Frescaroli. And I met uh, a number of years ago when we were both appointed to the Michigan Council on Future Mobility. And we've had, uh, I've had the pleasure of being able to work with Emily on a number of these panels and discussions and, and a number of other events in addition to the council over the last few years. Uh, Emily is the managing counsel of the product litigation group for Ford Motor Company, including product litigation, asbestos, and discovery teams. She also advises globally on automotive safety, regulatory, and product liability issues, including a focus on autonomous vehicles and mobility. She has extensive experience handling complex product litigation cases, regulatory matters with NHTSA, and other governmental entities and product defect investigations. She is also co-chair of the Legal and Insurance Working Group of M City at the University of Michigan and a lecturer at the University of Michigan Law School, where she teaches a class about the legal issues involved with autonomous vehicles. In 2017, she was appointed by Governor Rick Snyder to the Mich Michigan Council on Future Mobility. And in 2019, she was appointed by J uh, Governor John Kasich to the Drive Ohio Expert Advisory Board. She earned her JD cum laude from Wayne State University and was the editor of the Wayne Law Review. She earned her BS in aerospace engineering from the University of Southern California and her master's of engineering in aerospace engineering from uh, the University of Michigan. Prior to practicing law, she worked in engineering at both Ford and NASA. So with that, Emily, I wanna turn it over to you for some opening remarks. All right, thank you, Amy. Um, so I'm gonna, take us in a slightly different direction than our three earlier panelists, because I'm gonna focus my comments, first of all, primarily on higher levels of automation. Um, and then also, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the regulatory environment, um, as opposed to the litigation environment, which I'm happy to answer all sorts of questions about, but I can never um, avoid the opportunity to talk a little bit about regulation because this is such an important legal issue in this space. So we know that highly automated vehicles have a huge amount of potential to really um, save lives and expand mobility and uh, perhaps do things uh, for congestion in the environment and things like that. And with all this uh, potential and the rapidly developing technological um, uh, technology that you know auto companies and tech companies and everybody's working on we have all sorts of great things that are coming that have a huge amount of potential but what we lack is a modern regulatory framework and this is becoming a barrier um, to innovation and deployment of some of these technologies 
And so I want to just talk a little bit about why we need to have the right public policies in place. Brian talked a little bit about some of the work that NHTSA is doing, and I want to just explain to you why that is so important. So just as a sort of a baseline, um, for those of you who maybe haven't heard of them before, we have this whole collection of requirements that are applicable to vehicles in the US. They're called Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, or FMVSS. Right now, we don't have any FMVSSs that are uniquely applicable to automated vehicles. So there's no FMVSS for uh, an SAE level four type vehicle uniquely. But lots of these FMVSS requirements are applicable to all vehicles, so any motor vehicle that goes on a public road. Um, some of those FMVSSs are a barrier to um, high, high levels of automation when we start talking about things like not having any operator controls. So for example, if you have a design that contemplates not having a steering wheel or a brake pedal or an accelerator pedal, um, that is, may not be allowed under our current regulatory scheme. And just as an example, I'll talk about FMVSS 135, which has to do with braking performance. And the general requirements of 135 are you know, that your brake system has to perform in a certain way in order to bring the vehicle to, its, to a stop. Uh, you know, with a certain force applied to the brake pedal and over a certain distance. So it's all about making sure you have brakes that work on the vehicle. Um, but there is also a requirement in FMVSS 135 that it have a, that the vehicle have a, a foot operated brake control, meaning brake pedal. So there's literally a requirement in FMVSS 135 that you have a brake pedal. So if you have a design that doesn't contemplate having a brake pedal because you don't have any operator controls, as you might imagine, um, might be an optimal design solution in a very high level of automation vehicle, that is not currently permitted under our existing regulatory structure. This was, uh, this, this issue was studied by Volpe, um, which is a research arm of NHTSA in 2016. Uh, and confirmed by a Google interpretation issued by NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, around the same time. They went through all of the 100 plus federal motor vehicle safety standards and said that many of them would be a challenge for vehicles that lack conventional operator controls. So what do we do about this? Um, there are some, a few options that um, frequently get talked about. There's interpretation, and interpretation is where um, uh, NHTSA could say how they're going to interpret a rule. Um, but as I mentioned, Google already did an interpretation to NHTSA, and the 135 issue, for example, was one where they specifically said, if you don't have a brake pedal, you can't meet 135, and there's no way to get around that. Um, a second option is exemptions, which you may have heard of. They're, um, uh, uh, Neuro, for example, was just granted an exemption, and GM has an exemption petition that's pending with NHTSA. Um, but the problem with exemptions is um, right now, by statute, they're limited to a very low volume. So you could get permission from NHTSA to not meet a Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard if you could demonstrate equivalent safety, but you would be limited to 2,500 vehicles a year for a period of two years which is um, not a viable business model for, for most uh, big companies thinking about getting into this space. So the third possibility is legislation. Um, Congress could change the rules. They could change the rules around exemptions in particular and increase um, exemption caps to allow larger volumes. Um, there were bills that were pending in Congress um, at the end of um, 2018 uh, that didn't quite make it across the finish line. And so there's been more work to try to um, work on that again at the federal level. But as I'm sure most of you can imagine, getting federal legislation passed is not an easy task. And so that has um, significant uncertainty around it. So the reason I talk about all this is just to demonstrate to you that um, there's lots of interesting liability issues, and we'll talk about some of those. But as sort of a gateway to some of this, 
um, we may not see some of the technologies that provide the most interesting potential for a while because we just don't have a regulatory framework that will allow it. So with that, I will kick it back to you, Amy. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I want to move into some, uh, some Q&A for our panelists, which uh, I'm sure will lead to some interesting discussion topics, and, and uh, we'll just see where this takes us. Um, going back, David, to you, you, in your opening remarks, you stated that the ultimate goal of ADAS and automation technologies in, is to improve traffic safety and reduce crashes. Um, even with that, though, there have been several notable crashes in the last few years that involve vehicles with automated systems and improper use of those systems. When we think about the, the legal liability um, issues associated with that and some of the comments that, uh, that Tom started with about litigation, I uh, wonder from your perspective, could you offer some insights based on the research findings that explore this topic, and then we'll open it up to the other panelists to, um, to talk about the impact of those crashes on the legal and regulatory environment. Sure, Amy, uh, thank you uh, so much uh, for the question. I, I think for me is really, uh, when you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna use the, the very first uh, crash that's involving the Tesla vehicle that, that occurred back in 2016, um, because that has been uh, talked about uh, being researched um, you know, by a lot of people using it as an um, example. What happened is when you look at the, uh, the investigation report that was, uh, that's now available by the National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, what you all see is that um, basically one of the probable costs is the user of Tesla, of the, uh, the driver of that vehicle, um, basically has a over-reliance on the system. And I think that point, and, and, and I think that probably cost align very well with some, some of our research findings, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, in December of last year, uh, Virginia Tech, uh, under our contract, published a report, and it was, you know, we, we found that too, we found that to be true as well, is that when people I uh, began to uh, get too comfortable because they have a blind spot warning system. They have, uh, uh, they have a uh, lane keep system. They begin to uh, relax and engage in some other behavior. And I think, I think it is very important for us to continue as the provider, as, a, uh, as the, uh, I mean, developer, as the community that's providing, that's bringing these vehicle automation technology to other people is that we also have the responsibility to continue to, uh, to train, to educate, to re-educate everyone about how these systems are supposed to be, uh, supposed to be used. And, um, and a phrase that we often use in the, in the research, I mean, community that's, uh, you know, that's doing work related to behavior, to human factor is mental model, is that we wanna help basically all the user to um, build proper mental model. Mental model basically is the understanding, your understanding of how certain, uh, certain um, systems um, is supposed to work. That we want to build a proper mental mo model so people, all the user, driver, can understand what's the intended function of a particular system, what are some of the limitations so that we can prevent misuse and misbehavior um, I'm sure many of you have seen some YouTube where people are um, showing up uh, their uh, so-called automated vehicle and doing a lot of dangerous things. And those are exactly things we're trying to avoid. So uh, Amy, I'll pause here and then I'll let, let uh, other panelists to, uh, to uh, share their thoughts as well. Great. Any other uh, comments from the other panelists? But Tom, I was particularly thinking about you when the uh, when uh, David mentioned this idea of mental the mental model and the developers, you know, sort of trying to uh, to move towards that. Has that concept come up at all? In uh, maybe not called that exact thing, but has that concept entered the litigation world? Or how, what's your perspective on on these issues? I haven't I haven't heard it referred to in those terms, but the issues that David just um, addressed are certainly core issues in the litigation that, that we're defending today. 
I think the, the OEMs and suppliers are doing a good job in development, production, and release of this technology. And, and I think that their intention is to make safe vehicles safer. And, and you know, these are companies that understand the product liability, automotive product liability um, landscape very well from decades of experience. And so they're not looking to cut corners um, in, in terms of the way that they are uh, developing and releasing this technology. Uh, my, my general advice, to the extent anyone wants to, to hear it, is to be careful about overselling the technology and to provide clear and consistent messaging to users to make it clear, to make it really clear that the user is still the driver. If, uh, if we spend some time to look at uh, the, I think what is probably the, the operative Society of Automotive Engineers uh, standard that defines the levels of autonomous vehicle operation, it's SAE J3016, we, we would see very clearly that the SAE has said at levels one and two, the human behind the wheel is the driver, even when that technology is activated. And so uh, I, I think uh, certainly with level one and level two, that means the driver is still driving, that message must be delivered. And I think OEMs are doing a, a decent job to deliver that message. Great, thank you. Well, we've touched a little bit already on the, the roles and responsibilities of some of the stakeholders, um, particularly the developers, and a little bit on uh, the users and drivers of the vehicles. Um, there are other stakeholders as well, and perhaps even additional comments that uh, you all would like to make on the, the roles of, of all the different stakeholders to ensure that the intended goal of ADAS vehicle automation can actually be, be achieved. Um, and, and also part of that question may be, in addition to obviously improving safety and reducing the number of crashes, which is an important piece of the automation and a very critical piece, but are there other um, are there other uh, sort of ultimate goals of ADAS that, that play into this, uh, this new landscape of legal liability and how does that impact what the different stakeholder responsibilities are? Anyone want to comment on that? Don't all speak at once. So this is, this is Ryan. You know, and I think, you know, having, having kind of worked in industry and then the government side and been there when, when automated vehicles and ADAS started really kind of coming about, um, you know, obviously, you know, safety is a core to all of this. Um, but if you start looking at, you know, kind of ADAS and automated vehicles, you know, kind of the mobility revolution that, that everybody's kind of anticipating is happening. Um, really is, you know, how do you kind of help the underserved population, right? How do you give mobility services and mobility to the underserved populations? Um, and then how do you give people back some of their time while they're in the vehicles as you get some of these higher levels of automation? Um, you know, how do you give uh, people so, do other tasks while they're driving? So I mean, I think there's, there's multiple aspects that, um, you know, ADAS and AV developers are looking at, you know, in addition to safety, uh, to kind of improve transportation as a whole. So I mean, there's, there's many different, you know, because it's a uh, societal uh, impacts to all of this. And I think that's what everybody's uh, working towards. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, and, and if I may add, you know, I'm yes. really uh, not my area of expertise, but just from being involved with these issues over the years, it's also clear that one of the goals is to just make mobility available to, uh, to a larger percentage of the population on the globe. I mean, here in the United States, we have the luxury of personally owned vehicles, uh, various uh, degrees and types of mass transit. Uh, there are many parts of the world that will really benefit from the type of, of mobility, uh, the broader accessibility to mobility that this technology, I think, uh, will unleash as time goes on. And we see more and more um, fleet vehicles that are able to operate at level three and, and higher levels of autonomy. So I, I think that is a, um, a fascinating development 
uh, that we're going to see unfolding over the next decade. Amy, I, I also want to also kind of kind of follow up on one of the remark that Tom made earlier about the fact that uh, basically, um, you know, I think everyone needs to, um, you know, basically everyone's role need to be clear and uh, basically the OEN, the developers, they don't oversell the product. And I think I think that that to me is one of the very important aspects about the liability of the system. I mean, you can we we have seen um, uh, from from many other uh, areas where you have you can have a well designed product uh, with a with a good intention. However, when those product has been misunderstood or uh, well their capability or, or uh, has been uh, mis uh, has been oversold. Uh, you can have a disastrous uh, result, and I think I, I think to me is that to me is a sheer responsibility among the developer, among the um, the provider, as well as the user as well. So a lot of time when I hear the certain um, people um, on basically um, basically on, on public, you know, kind of trying to sell a product that that's really uh that's not really you know or, or, or you know provide information that's maybe years away but you know it's it's a goal um you know that can cause um you know that can lead into uh improper understanding by the user by the consumer and that can wind up being um you know very very um unpleasant result so so i think for me is that the roles and responsibility I think there, there are certain things that each, uh, you know, the you know, developer and the manufacturer has certain role, the user has certain role, but there's also some sheer responsibility um, so, so we can promote and we can continue to develop uh, these uh, vehicle automations. Great, thank you. Um, Emily, I wanted to, uh, and, and, and perhaps Ryan as well and others, I want to turn for a minute, I, I do want to leave a couple minutes at the end to get to uh, make sure we get to the discussion of data. But before we, uh, before we go there, and we also have a couple questions coming in from, um, from the audience, uh, but before we get to those, I would like to uh, turn back a little bit to the regulatory environment. You've mentioned some of the regulatory bar uh, barriers that are currently in existence um, that are you know, potentially impeding the deployment of, of AV technology. Uh, so first question is, are there, are there other barriers that you see in the regulatory environment? And uh, also, if you could comment on the appropriate balance. We've talked a little bit since the regulatory world is sort of my, uh, part of my focus in my role. I find it interesting, this, this balance between state and federal regulation in, in various kinds of industries. Um, so could you talk about it a little bit as it impacts uh, the automated vehicle technology and, and really the need for regulation and then regulation isn't necessarily a dirty word in this space. Um, yeah, sure. So I guess let me start with that, you know, need for regulation and how that ties in also to, you know, to state, state rules and the state role in all of this. So, um, you know, back going back a number of years um, when people when the industry started talking about automated technology um, a lot of states got interested because they thought about the possibility of having you know driverless cars in their state maybe even vehicles that don't even have a steering wheel brake pedal and accelerator pedal and because there are, as I mentioned at the beginning there are no regulations uniquely applicable to these type of vehicles, I think a lot of states felt like um, in the absence of some federal action on this, that they needed to step into the fray and we saw this proliferation of a whole bunch of states coming up with a set of rules for testing and deployment of highly automated vehicles um, in their states. And so that, that which is commonly referred to sort of as this patchwork of requirements um, was another potential barrier to the deployment of some of this technology because if you have you know california doing 
one set of regulatory requirements and Ohio has something different and Florida has something different and what you know you pick whatever states you'd like um, it started to be, feel like this situation where you couldn't comply necessarily with all of these individual state requirements with one one vehicle or you know one set of software and so the industry kind of rallied and said you know we we, we can't have this state-by-state state patchwork of requirements um, thankfully, NHTSA really stepped into the fray and, and raised her hand and said, hey, listen, regulation of safety of vehicle equipment is, is our job. Um, they published a number of different um, policies um, that have, you know, that they've updated over the years. And while they haven't um, developed a regulatory framework for vehicles yet, yeah, they've begun rulemaking in that space and, and really stuck a stake in the ground and said, when we're talking about safety of automated vehicles and, and equipment safety, that's that's NHTSA's job to regulate. It's a little confusing because the traditional role between state and federal um, regulators on vehicle safety is, for a very long time has been NHTSA regulates vehicles performance and vehicle equipment performance and states regulate driver safety. We have things like driving tests and driver exams and, and, and whatnot and insurance and liability. Um, and that was sort of the division. And now we've got this unique situation where the vehicle may become the driver. And so maybe there's some confusion about whether states regulate virtual drivers or whether the federal government would regulate virtual drivers. And NHTSA has pretty clearly said, we, we think we own that space. And when there's regulations, we will be the ones to do them. And in the meantime, what we're gonna ask manufacturers to do is submit these um, uh, safety assurance letters uh, that describe what they're doing in this number of different areas to make sure their vehicles are safe and publish that and so that data will be available um, to anybody and that's what we're that's a process we're going to follow while we're working on rulemaking one to reduce the barriers that i talked about before and then to um you know at some point in the future develop a, a new regulatory framework that's specifically developed towards high, highly automated vehicles but in all honesty that's probably a ways off. When NHTSA did all that, when they issued all these policy statements, they did say, though, you know, rele relevant to our conversation today, um, a couple of issues we're not going to tackle and still lie squarely in the state um, control, and that's insurance and, and liability. They said we're not going to get into the business of deciding um, liability other than, you know, whatever the law is that currently exists. Um, with respect to preemption that Tom Jared mentioned before. And I could talk about that for hours, but everyone would be asleep. So hopefully that was an answer to your question um, about what other barriers there are. Yeah, thank you. Any any other um, comments from Tom or Ryan in particular, or, or uh, David? Sure, this is Ryan. Um, go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead, go ahead, Tom. Well, from right, I'll make my quick. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, you know, yeah, and, and I mentioned, uh, you know, in the, the policy statements that NHTSA has issued, and, you know, they came out with AB 4.0 uh, last December. Um, and, and so NHTSA really, you know, regula regulations take many, many years to get through between a, a notice of proposed rulemaking and a final rule. So, you know, rulemakings are, are fairly far off, um, but NHTSA has started some of that activity. And, you know, in, in AB 4.0, they really pushed for voluntary consensus standards. So this is things like, you know, SAE and ISO standards. And it says looking for um, some leadership from some of these, you know, consortia and uh, standards bodies to help develop some of these voluntary consensus standards, which then um, potentially could feed into regulation. So NHTSA is looking to, you know, industry, academia, and others to help um, move that along to help support rulemaking as it goes forward. This is Tom. From a trial lawyer's perspective, it would be great for us to have specific relevant federal motor vehicle safety standards uh, in, in defense of the OEMs and suppliers over this technology. Uh, one of the primary technical defenses that we have traditionally relied on in defending automotive product liability cases is the manufacturer's compliance with the federal standard. Uh, for example, the, um, the, the value of that defense 
in many states, uh, including Michigan, where I'm from and where the domestic car companies are based, is that the compliance with an applicable, relevant federal standard uh, can lead to a presumption um, from the court to the jury that the product is not defective. So uh, that that's a very powerful defense. And as Ryan said, it, uh, Ryan and Emily both said, it takes quite a bit of time for federal motor vehicle safety standards to be uh, promulgated so that we can use them. But when that day comes, uh, that will be a very important defense for us in addition to the way that federal preemption seems to be uh, taking hold in, in a small number of jurisdictions. So like Emily, uh, I share the view that taking time for this group to talk about federal preemption would be the fastest way to get people to leave the meeting. So I'll just leave it at that and uh, let David chime in. Well, Tom, Tom I, I uh, just that that's not really the area um, I have a lot of expertise. So I think you guys all provide pretty good answers. So Amy, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Well, um, we we have just a few minutes left, and I promised that we would at least turn for a moment to the topic of data because this is a big one, and uh, we can't do it justice in the next four minutes. But Let's talk just for a, a few minutes about data and how we need to think about it and the impact on the legal and regulatory environment. Obviously, it plays a, a role in the litigation involving these vehicles. Um, and and Tom, I was really interested to hear you say that you know that uh, that the litigation is almost being used as a vehicle to try to get data for other purposes. But I'm sure there are lots of considerations. Do we have any any thoughts from the panelists about uh, how data impacts the legal and regulatory? liability landscape going forward. And I'll just open it up. Well, th this is Tom. Very quickly, the, the, the data that is going to be, that is, is available and that will be available as um, this technology unfolds is deep, deep, rich, and growing. And uh, this is not your, this is not your traditional EDR data that is so primarily or, or so focused on vehicle dynamics. Uh, this data certainly will cover vehicle dynamics, but it will cover issues about user slash driver conduct uh, that is not really covered uh, beyond seatbelt usage in most um, traditional um, event data recorder data sets. So in litigation, the data will be very valuable. Uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll just quickly throw out a couple of other issues that relate to the data, and that is, uh, probably the most obvious one, and that is privacy and ownership of the data. Who owns the data? How is the data being used in, in a way that could, um, in the minds of, of many people, be a violation of privacy rights? And then uh, how long must the data be preserved? So now that I've thrown those, those points out there, I'll, I'll be quiet and let others chime in. This is Emily. I'll just I'll just quickly add. I mean, the data is important, and we're probably going to need access to more and different types of data to help us sort out some of these issues in the the liability arena. But I would also just caution people that data doesn't always um, give us the definitive answer in terms of liability, for example, and that there are limitations. Um, even to, you know, even in the data that we have today, we, we we sometimes see different interpretations of what data means. We talk about things like video, for example, and video is great, um, but it doesn't always give you an explicit um, technical answer to problems. So, you know, I think there's going to be plenty of jobs for lawyers in the future trying to sort out liability issues, even with uh, lots of extra data to help us. Yeah, great points. Ryan or David, any last comments on data? I think Amy from from the from the research uh, perspective, I think you know data is really uh, you know to me and to many other researchers is we want to use the data, utilize the data to understand um, many of the issues that can help hopefully. Uh, resolve some of the liability um, kind of gray area. 
And uh, I think one of the challenges that we have seen uh, up until uh, this uh, last year is that um, basically um, some developers, some manufacturers willingness to share the data. And I'm just, you know, so, so for me is I, I'm, I was very encouraged uh, last year, began to see some of the trend that some of the uh, larger company who has these data began to share some, some of the data that they collected. So basically as a whole, uh, as a, I mean, whole, I mean, community, we can uh, begin to better understand and better design the product and also have a complementary strategy to uh, really, uh, truly uh, get to the goal of improving safety using these uh, vehicle uh, technologies. That's my, um, that's my thoughts. Great. Ryan, last words? Oh, since I think it looks like we're over time, I think everybody else hit the, hit the points fairly well. So I will pass it back to you. Great. Well, thank you. I want, I, it looks like we are at uh, 1125, Calvin, so I don't think we have time for questions from the audience. And I apologize. This is a, a really robust discussion that we would love to continue uh, at a different event or a different time. So thank you to all of the panelists and thank you to Calvin and uh, CCAT for hosting this and, and making the adjustment to have it online. It's been really fun for me. And uh, as I sit here by my fire during this fireside chat, I am actually seeing snowflakes outside. So I guess it was appropriate <laughs> that it continue to be a fireside chat. And, um, uh, but this has been a, a very interesting forum and uh, really appreciate everybody's time. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs>